Hello and welcome to our show from our London studios. I'm Dr. Amara Suhail. We have a very special guest in our studios today who needs no introduction. Malika Bukhari, a very bright name in the history of Pakistani politics. A former member of parliament and parliamentary secretary of law and justice between 2018 and 2022. She had been at the forefront of the legislative reform agenda and she has played a great role in enacting important legislation pertaining to women's rights, inheritance, provision of legal aid, and the Civil Procedure Code. She played a major part um, with the legal team that drafted the landmark anti-rape laws for Pakistan that abolished very silly virginity testing for the victims of sexual violence. She's in UK. Um, for personal reasons, and despite a very busy um, uh, and hectic schedule, she spared time to come to our studios. So let's welcome Malika Bukhari. Thank you very much, Malika, for joining us in the studio today. And uh, uh, we at Q's feel very honored with your presence in the studio. So thank you very, very much once again. Thank you very much. It's an absolute pleasure to be here with you today. Thank you for inviting me to speak with you and for giving me this platform. Um, to share my views and I just want to say that Q's News is doing a wonderful job in representing the views of the Pakistani diaspora and of course bringing information to Pakistanis uh, worldwide so well done on that and uh, thank you very much for allowing me to be part of this platform. It's our thank pleasure. You. You. So uh, you're, you know uh, Malika you need no introduction because anyone who has got even the slightest interest in Pakistani politics they are very familiar with your background but our viewers would like to know about your background because you didn't join politics just like that. You've got a long history and we would like you to share your, um, your background with us. Thank you very much. So um, I always like to talk about women in politics. It's my favorite subject. And of course, it's, I think it's so important to share women. It's so important for women to share their journeys on how they became part of politics, why public life is so important for women why women need to be represented uh, in the corridors of power. It's ex extremely essential and I always talk about my journey and especially to young women who are thinking of join joining politics. I always say to them that this is an important uh, profession. It's an important public service. It's an important civic duty that we must all perform. The corridors of power are not dedicated to men. They're also there for women. And women of Pakistan are 50% of the entire population. So if you have a parliament that doesn't include women, you essentially have a parliament that doesn't represent half of your population. That can never be correct for any democracy or any country. So I always believe that that's what women should do. So my journey into politics has been very long. I started off uh, with my dream of becoming a lawyer, you know, and I got educated in England, actually. Um, I moved to England when I was about 13 years old with my family. I lived here for more than a decade. I went to college in England. I went to university in England. I got called to the bar at Middle Temple. Uh, I'm a Queen Mother Scholar, so I got a scholarship from Middle Temple to pursue the bar. <coughs> then I worked in uh, London for about six years as a barrister. And then um, I saw Imran Khan deliver a speech at Minar Pakistan in Lahore. Um, and I thought to myself that I, I have to be part of this really important movement for Naya Pakistan, uh, you know, and as a Pakistani, British Pakistani, I felt, you know, I, I absolutely have to, have to contribute to this. So I must do something, even if it means volunteering for a political party. And I think my mother always says to me that I think you did law only to do politics. And I, I agree with that because law and politics have such a close connection, such a close nexus that if you are to be a parliamentarian, it's essential that you know what lawmaking is. So I'm glad that I, you know, pursued my career as a barrister and that obviously helped me into parliament. And then I went to Pakistan and I started practicing in a corporate law firm. And this is all when my son was very young, you know, so I was, got married. I had a son who was about three years old when I joined politics, actually, two and a half. Uh, I, he moved to Pakistan with me. And I started working in a big corporate law firm. At the same time, I got introduced into PTI by the former president of Pakistan, actually, Mr. Arif Alvi. I remember he came into my law firm and asked to do some legislation and some support on legal reform. And I very gladly did that for him. And then there was no looking back. 
you know, PTI was a political party that I obviously felt very close to. I was driven uh, by their ideology. I was driven by the principles that the party stood by. And for me, it was a natural choice, a natural progression that I become part of that political party's legal advice team. Uh, the former Prime Minister Imran Khan, um, who is fighting a very long incarceration, a very unjust incarceration in jail right now, gave me the opportunity, a seat on the table. So I don't know about, well, well, political parties across Pakistan don't give young women in politics, I mean, middle class women in politics, professional women in politics, a seat at the, at the table. But I got a seat at the table. Um, Imran Khan allowed me to sit on the table and, you know, said, well, actually, there is a space for you over here. And if you want to contribute, uh, I will allow you to do that. And there were many young people like me. And at that time, I was young and now I'm quite middle aged. But, you know, 10, 12 years ago, um, a lot of women uh, like me, Kamal Shozab, Zartaj Gul, Alia Hamza, Murad Saeed, Farooq Khabib. I mean, I can name a lot of people. Young, middle-class Pakistanis were given a seat on the table by the former prime minister, and that's how my journey into politics solidified. That's how it became concrete. So you're saying that you heard Imran Khan um, a speech at uh, Minari Pakistan. So, of course, like a lot of people in Pakistan, they take inspiration from him. But there has to be some motivation behind because... You were not there just by accident. You went there for a reason. Yeah. And at what stage in your life did you think that you could, you had that um, thing about uh, the interest in politics uh, that resulted in you listening to his speech in the first place? Yeah, absolutely. So from a very young age, um, I remember that uh, every time I would read the newspaper or I would uh, study a legal article, I would always keenly follow politics, whether it was United Kingdom, it was global politics or politics across Pakistan. So I always felt and believed that parliament is the legislative body, the most important supreme body that allows you to make the biggest impact. So if you are a parliamentarian, you can do much more for the people of Pakistan or any other country, because parliament is is the most important lawmaking body. Parliament impacts what happens to people. You know, sometimes I hear people say, I don't do politics. And I think, well, you don't do anything then. You know, politics is so critical to our lives that if you don't do politics, you hardly do anything then, but, you know. But that's very correct because there are so many people who follow politics is like an entertainment in Pakistan because <laughs> if you watch uh, Pakistani yeah. t uh, television, you see most of the times it's like these talk shows and things like that. And even though a lot of people, they follow them, but for a lot of women who may have that inspiration, they would think that it may be challenging and it's not safe. And there is dirty politics in Pakistan yes. and women should stay away from it. So did you face any hurdles or any challenges when oh. you were following this journey? <laughs> I could actually write a whole book on the challenges that women face in politics or just in the journey to public life. Of course, there are many impediments, you know, especially if you are a Pakistani woman, a woman, and you want to join politics, but nobody from your family is in politics. It's, it's a very tall order. Yeah. Um, because, you know, politics until PTI came as a third alternative was basically, it was, it was a domain for women who had political lineage, you know, so very privileged women whose fathers or brothers were it's in politics. It's a male-dominating so area. Yeah, they were extension of their patriarchs, mm -hmm. basically. So, you know, a man would nominate a woman to do politics, but PTI changed that. So, of course, impediments were there. And I felt, you know, I remember I said to my family, um, I want to do politics. And my father and mother said to me, you have such a great profession as a barrister. Why would you join something so bad like politics? I remember and I said, look, I think it can make impact. I want to legislate for women. I want to change the legal framework of my country. I want to reform laws. And I can't do that as a lawyer. I have to do more than that. And politics is the essential tool that will allow me to do that. And my parents thought I was actually half mad. And they said, actually, no, let's not pay attention to her because she likes to daydream sometimes. And actually, I always say to people, the, my dreams started scaring my family. They were like, her dream, my mother said to me, her dreams are actually quite scary. Don't do this, please. And I said, look, I am going to do it. And I had the support of some members of my family and my parents just watched me just do it. But yes, of course, not having a father or brother or husband in politics was an impediment. You know, asking for a seat at the table always means a woman has to take out her credentials. So every time I would say, I want to be a member of this committee or this 
sit, put me on the core committee or, or give me a seat at the table, I would almost have to say why I qualify for it, you know? So it's an impediment. You almost have to bring out your CV. But if you made you it always... sound like Imran Khan spotted you and knew that this woman has got credentials to bring yeah. her into the right path. And uh, so do you think he made the journey easy for you, even though it can be very challenging? Um... I, think he, I think he did. Yeah. I, I think he did. I think the fact that for him, it did. he never asked me what my father does, actually. He never asked me what my husband did. He never asked me what my brother did. So we never had that conversation. He always asked me, so what are you bringing to the table? And I think that's really important. Uh, in Pakistani politics and other political parties like PMLN or People's Party, it, 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 it's important where your family comes from. But in PTI, it's not important where your family comes from. It's important that you bring something important to the table, that you are educated, that you are committed to change, that you want to reform. So from Imran Khan, my credentials were important. And if I brought something, good to the table in terms of a change, policy making, legal reform, you know, public speaking, there was a seat for me. And I think he also, he also encouraged young people to get yeah, into This is politics. what I was going to ask you, you the know. presence of people like yourself, who could have lived a very comfortable life yeah. in UK, being a barrister, doing a good practice, um, and didn't have to worry about, even if you didn't go back to Pakistan, life would have been wonderful yeah. for you. Mm -hmm. For you to choose a path that was difficult, it is an inspiration. And of course, you. you that is why women in Pakistan look up to you as a role model, because they think if somebody of your stature could live a good life in UK, yes. wh what are we doing? And um, Imran Khan had an eye for that. He didn't care about your background and he facilitated it. So do you think that um, you have to be um, of a very strong personality to uh, be able to follow your dreams in Pakistan because yeah. we have seen so many women leaving politics because they could not face the hurdles. Yeah, absolutely. I think that uh, you obviously need a lot of strength as a woman to do politics in Pakistan. And you mentioned that. And it goes down to the fact that your life is, a, is, a, is an open book. So everybody can talk about your life. Everybody can comment on your life. I'm happy to be held accountable as a public servant because that's, that's the rule of politics, that, that if you are a public servant, the people of your country hold you accountable because they elect you. But the fact that everybody gets to say anything about your personal life and then character vilification, you know, then online hate on social media. So Pakistan, I think our country is now, I mean, women, women have progressed so far now in Pakistan and there are so many brave women that are, I seek inspiration from in Pakistan. You know, but I think 10 years ago when I started politics, I felt that the space to express dissent on, on social media platforms was very limited. Mm. And that to me came at a personal cost, you know. So everybody said what they wanted to. Everybody critiqued me in a way which was quite sexist, frankly. Mm. It had very bad undertones of misogyny. And frankly, it became quite wild at times. And sometimes, you know, I remember, um, I would switch off my phone and not read what is being written about me but on did, social did media. Did that put you off? No, actually. Um, that strengthened my resolve to do it because I thought, actually, this fight is worth fighting. The fact that they are so upset with my ability to express myself means it must be super important. I mean, nobody kicks a dead log. So if they are... If this is irritating them, if everybody has a view on it, and I fundamentally believe that what I was saying uh, was important to the women of my country, and I thought, I'm not going to give up my fight or my right to express myself because 100 people think that they can go and say wild, very disgusting, dirty stuff about me. And of course, it hurt my family members. Mm -hmm. So they say, we no longer follow your social media profiles because we cannot read what is sometimes written on them, it hurts us. So of course it comes at personal cost, that it upsets your family, it hurts. I mean, it really hurt me sometimes, you know, I have to admit, but it also strengthened my ability. So what doesn't kill you, it's cliche, right, makes you stronger. So you come out the other side stronger. And I remember when I started off as a public servant or an aspiring politician, I was not this brave, you know? So it takes, it takes a journey. Uh, it takes, it's, it's, it's a long journey to, sometimes I felt like, it's, there were not moments where I didn't feel scared. It's okay to fear things, but I did it whilst I was scared. You know, even today, sometimes I do things which frankly sometimes scare me, but I still do them because it's but fine to is, do them this scared. This is important, you know, so instead of 
facing those challenges, it didn't scare you off. Instead, you became even more stronger. Yeah. And if you look at the Western media, they portray Pakistani women as very mm. oppressed and they've got no say in, um, in any field in, um, of life. Uh, leave alone politics. And Absolutely. that's where they um, portrayed um, uh, this Malala uh, yes. Yusufzai as, <laughs> as somebody who spoke about uh, women education. But actually, we belonging to Pakistan, we know what uh, education uh, for Pakistani women means. So what would you say to the Western world? How um, I mean, this portrayal is absolutely not correct. Yeah, it's not correct. I think, um, of course, Pakistani women face a lot of difficulties that we discuss. But they're not just uh, distinct to Pakistan. Women all over the world are facing challenges. Even in America, women face challenges in politics, in public life, in their personal lives. In the UK, a lot of rape trials, I believe, uh, couldn't proceed because there were a lot of errors made by the police in the Crown Prosecution Service. You know, I read this in an article. And women, uh, you know, are facing all sorts of issues in this very well, well developed democracy. So issues are not distinct to Pakistan. And I think the women of Pakistan are very brave. You know, I remember every time I used to sit on a plane from my journey to Islamabad, between Islamabad and another city, because I lived somewhere else and I worked somewhere else, and I had to travel every single weekend. And I remember I would always ask the person who would issue my boarding pass, please put me between two women. And he'd be like, don't you want a seat that is separate? And I said, no, I just want to sit between two women. Because every time I would speak to the woman on my right and left, I would be inspired. Such strong women. I mean, nothing is easy for them, right? Climate economic conditions, you know, um, lack of implementation of laws, you name it. These women have challenges that women have never seen in the world. And yet the resolve is so strong, yet they beat these challenges. And, you know, these, they defeat these big mountains to achieve what they want. So Pakistani women are resolute. And if you look at They're the history, brave. we've had very yeah. strong women like Fat um, you start from Fatma Jinnah, absolutely, and you talk, you talk it. I, you know, you name it. I mean, I, I wrote this children's book actually, which I don't talk about much, but it's called Pakistan Power Girls, and it's just about Pakistani women. Is that Pinochet Bhutto? Look, we had the absolutely. first woman prime minister in in the Muslim world. You know, we have role models, Shiri Mazari. You know, you, we have doctors. Rana Liaquat Khan, Khan. Khan. She was Khan. very forthcoming in you politics. Know, Noor Jahan. You know, these women, these are strong women who achieve excellence in the Seema Kamil, Deputy Governor of State Bank, you know, um, Samia Beg. Uh, she climb, climbs mountains. Sana Mir, captain of Pakistani cricket team. I mean, you touch an area and you will find a strong Pakistani woman breaking glass ceilings. Absolutely. So no, Pakistani we have women seen are not. generals in uh, Pakistani. Yes. Yeah, General uh, Nagar. Yeah. You know, so Pakistan, um, Aisha Farooq, that PF captain, I mean, you name it. So Pakistani women are not weak. Pakistani women are rising to the challenge and they are making so many holes in these glass ceilings and I'm very proud of them. So this view of the West that Pakistani women are somehow weak, subjugated, you know, pushed in a corner and do not speak for themselves or cannot do that is absolutely incorrect. Yes, they have challenges. Yes, we have one of the worst infant child, um, infant mother mortality rates in the world. Yes, we have healthcare issues. Yes, domestic violence is, is our violence against women is endemic in our country. But women are fighting that. Women are speaking absolutely. up against that. They are claiming their rights. And my gen the generation that is coming, has come after me, is much more braver than me. And is it, do you think social media has got a role to play in that? I, I mean, I, I couldn't, I couldn't, you know, I mean, it's super important. So yes, it's, I couldn't stress upon it more. That social media, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube has given women and girls in Pakistan a platform that has empowered them. But do you think they may have gone a bit too far? Because we see these parades, Amira Jissam, Mary Marzi in Pakistan. Yeah. And living in West, you think, what are they doing? You know, because there are some cultural norms and there are some religious obligations. Still, you know, these things, they don't come across very well. Do you think there is a propaganda behind it? Um, no, actually, I mean, I, I think that um, women should have a right to participate in peaceful assembly. And we may not agree with the representation of how women are expressing their freedom. You know, of course, every, everybody in Pakistan had a view on it, like you said, that these slogans are not correct. And this is, this is not, this is culturally so incorrect. But I feel like 
the moment you start restricting women's ability to be present uh, in a protest or peaceful assembly, then you are curbing their right to be That's free. That's very correct. But these so. women who are actually representing in these uh, marches, they're not the true representatives of those women who are actually suffering mm. Um, mm. because they are all those women who are working in their houses as maids or living in the, you know, um, far-fetched areas. Yeah. So how do you think the representation should be where, where people don't think it's a Western propaganda, because this is what a lot of people say that this is a Western propaganda, and especially our mullahs, they are against it. Yeah. So they're against many things. Yeah, now. they're against <laughs> many things, and of course, like um, the extremists are everywhere. Yeah. But of course, like uh, Pakistan has produced role models, like you have mentioned a few names, and there are a lot many. We can't, yeah. if we start naming them, I think the, the yeah, list can, is countless. It's countless. So. Um, in terms of going forward, of course, uh, PTI is under a lot of, you know, yes. uh, victimization at the moment. And we are not going to talk about politics as such. But um, clearly, living abroad, we know that Imran Khan's presence in politics has made a difference. And a lot of our youth has woken up yes. to so many things that people, even though they were aware of it, but they won't come forward and talk about it openly. Yeah. So... What do you think is the is the way forward now? What is happening in Pakistan? It's sad, uh, but we do you see the light at the end of the tunnel? Yeah, I I think we must always keep hope alive, you know, and hope always wins. And I think uh, truth always eventually wins. Uh, and I I feel like there's always light at the end of darkness. So if it gets, and Imran Khan always says that, you know, when it gets really dark consider that there'll be light at the end of, it'll be morning the next day. So it gets super dark before it gets, it gets uh, quite clear and sunny, I believe. So yes, there is hope. Because uh, I see hope in the women of Pakistan. I see hope in the young people of Pakistan. Inshallah. I see hope in uh, the 60% youth of Pakistan that is able to go on the streets and protest peacefully, have a lawful peaceful assembly that are able to express their views on all platforms. I see a lot of potential in the people of Pakistan who are real fighters, you know. So uh, my colleagues in Pakistan, uh, you know, are fighting a real battle for the soul of our country. And I really uh, uh, take a lot of inspiration from them. They're much braver than me. You know, they, they do things that inspire me every day, you know. Kamal Shohzab, Zartaj Gul Wazir, you know, Alia Hamza, women like them. And are, every time you watch them, you, they appear more and more strong yeah, so and they're they not yeah, scared they're resolute or, and yeah. nothing nothing uh nothing seems to come in between them and their desire for ensuring that they are the true custodians of the country so who is in a democracy a custodian of a country the people of pakistan Absolutely. and it's a 240 million people by the way and a large proportion of that is young people so if young people women and the common man of pakistan is striving for their freedom, their fundamental rights for better economic conditions, then I think there is hope, you know. Um, and everywhere I meet people, Pakistanis, uh, every time I speak to somebody, whether it's somebody who is helping me at home, a house help, you know, a very intelligent banker or a lawyer, you know, a doctor, they always are full of hope and they're like, they always are thankful for what they have. So you see hope in these people's eyes, you know. And inshallah, Pakistan will see better days, inshallah. you know, and Pakistani women and youth will, as they are rising to the challenge, they will rise and they will claim what is rightfully theirs. You know, this country belongs to 240 million people and these 240 million people will ensure that their country is governed by a constitution, by a system of rule of law, you know, by, by people whom they elect. It's really important, yeah. you know. Uh, not enough discussion takes place on this internationally. But Pakistanis have a right to elect their representatives like every other country in the world, like people in America do, like in the United Kingdom do. Pakistanis also have that So you see there is right. a, a hope in there restoration of democracy Absolutely. in Pakistan. Absolutely. I think the people of Pakistan are fighting a brilliant fight and they will eventually win. They will prevail. Justice, Inshallah. truth uh, always prevails and hope must remain alive. And, you know, as long as they keep speaking for their rights, keep protesting, keep voicing, you know, uh, their, their, um, their commitment to change, I think there's, there's hope. Inshallah. There's a lot of hope. So coming back to you, um, any moment of your life, of your political career, where 
you felt that you are standing at a very difficult point <laughs> um, and you thought there's, a, there's no return but I have to make very difficult decisions yeah. here. Yeah, 26th of May 2023 I think was a very dark day in my life. Uh, I was at crossroads. I, I, I had to choose between things that were very dear to me and something that I fundamentally believed in. You know, so I don't, I, I, I really hope and pray and I always say this that I hope nobody, not even my worst political opponent, has to face that day. Um, you know, and I had to face it. And the entire world saw that. And it, it's a moment that really shook me. Um, uh, and I, when I left, uh, I think I remember that press conference, I thought, actually, I will never be able to come out of this. Okay, this is the end of what I <coughs> believe was, you know, made me strong, what, what made me who I am. So if you have a, a identity and a, and believe in an ideology, and you support a cause. If you, for me, if you take all of that away from me, it doesn't leave much behind. So I'm just a human being that exists, and I never like to exist. I like to live properly, you know. Um, so at that moment, I remember when I walked out of that um, that press conference, I I, I said to you know, I said to uh, I wouldn't like to name the girl who was there, and you know, I said to her. And I was in tears and I said, I, I don't think I'll be able to live this through. But Allah gives you strength, right? And the power of belief and the power of prayer is stronger than any form of oppression. You know, and I went through it. My family supported me, you know, but I saw many dark days. Sometimes it felt like it's never going to end. Sometimes it felt like I, I, I thought I'd lost my voice, my identity, my ability to speak, what I believed in. And it was just hollow and I could see absolutely no light at the end of the tunnel. But I lived through that, you know, and it made me stronger. And every day I, I took baby steps and I, I thought, actually, today I'm going to find this much strength in my strength. And now I'm here in England today, sitting in front of you, talking about that experience. I could not speak about that without crying, by the way. I can, I, I can but I have somehow found the strength to be able to speak about my experience without actually having a public breakdown, you know. And I never have a public breakdown, but I've had many, you know, in the past and... Uh, that's not me. I never show my emotions in, in public, not to the extent where I have to cry. But sometimes we all get so overwhelmed that it's not a weakness. We are actually. human beings. It's, it's, it's human beings. Weakness, you know? yeah. it's, it's to be able to show emotions is quite natural. But um, I'm here today speaking in front of you. And of course, I'm very grateful to you that you've given me this platform. And I'm practicing from a set of chambers in London, uh, you know, and I'm doing criminal law, human, international human rights work. And I never thought that I would have the strength to be able to do that. But um, you find strength. And I found strength from my colleagues, from all the brave women in Pakistan who told me, who showed me the path, who showed me that actually it's okay to do things whilst you're scared and to be able to find strength and to be able to seek what is really, to be able to rise to your calling. That's what I've done all my life. So we all have a calling and we must rise to that calling because to exist without a purpose is you know, then absolutely, it, it is no life. And as I said before, we I feel even more honored that you um, came and you shared your views because I get the inspiration and I'm sure a lot of our viewers, they would listen to you. And of course, you never gave up. Yeah. You stood there, you chose your path, and never gave up. So one last thing, um, a message for Pakistani women who oh, wow. think... Um, politics is something they can consider, but they are scared yeah. of the challenges. So. Um, what would you say to them? I always say that politics in Pakistan is absolutely worth doing. Public service is so intrinsic to the quality of life of women in Pakistan that you must always participate in it. Lawmaking, parliament and public bodies are not the domain of any one political party or a particular gender. Women belong in the corridors of power. You may face challenges like the challenges I faced. You may be threatened, intimidated, and harassed, but you must rise and you must claim what is rightfully yours. A place in parliament or any legislative body belongs to women as much as it belongs to any other citizen of Pakistan. So go there, take part in politics, rise to your true calling, make laws, make policies, make changes that serve your gender and the women of your country. Uh, and do it whether you're scared or you're not scared. But definitely do that. It's a profession. It's a career. It's a service that I would do all over again every single time, irrespective of everything that I face. So if, if I can do it, 
I, I'm sure you can, you can definitely do it. So viewers, you heard Malika Bukhari, her battle and her hurdles to gain the status in politics. Um, and she broke all the hurdles. She's a successful and an inspirational woman in various roles, not only as politician. So hope um, her conversation today makes a difference to how you feel about the role of women in Pakistani politics. So goodbye for now. We'll be back with another show next time.